Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session with Propreneur X and Raksha Mahabir. And uh, Ra uh, Rapalang is going to introduce you to her in a little bit. I just want to let you guys know that I'll be chatting to you a bit later about feedback from a letter we wrote to the minister for the property entrepreneurs. We won't record that part of the session. And enjoy the session today. I'll be in and out. Um, so please excuse me, but I will be watching from afar. <laughs> And Raksha and Rapalang will contact me if there are any technical issues. Many of you have identified marketing and branding as a gap when we did your one-on-ones and your gap analysis that Rapalang and I have been running for the last two weeks. So please do take note of the session and make sure that uh, you make the most of the session with Raksha. She likes an engaged session, but she'll tell you more about how she'd like to run the session. So hand over to you, Rapalang. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I think the guys are already used to me now working from my workspace. It's a mobile office, so I move around quite a lot. So um, yeah, because of the, the circumstance that <laughs> just beyond our control. So yeah, yeah, but I'm excited that uh, we're going to have a great session today. And just also congratulate um, um, Kuku um, that they really had a fantastic session during the week. So for some of you guys that didn't, you know, I uh, join in. You really missed a lot. So to do, they killed it, and uh, we really enjoyed the session. We were really, really inspired. And um, I think for for some of those who also want to follow the sessions that we run on this day that Jason normally post on 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 weekly basis, they are really fantastic. I mean, yesterday it was even a fantastic session. So you might want to to really join some of those sessions. So um, yeah, that's a good one. So today we have the pleasure again of <laughs> introducing to you the excited and the fantastic Raksha. So Raksha is not new to the family, is not new to the team. So you guys know Raksha extremely well because she started with us from last year when we were doing the selection. And then she did a session on the group gap analysis. And then uh, today she's going to be running the marketing session today and there i know that you know she's always very very passionate about that subject <laughs> it's amazing that most of the people that we get they're not only specialists but they're very passionate about those areas of knowledge that they deliver so i've never seen someone who's so passionate energetic and so knowledgeable in this area like raksha so raksha is really really amazing and i believe that you're going to have a very, very fantastic session today. And uh, yeah, without any further ado, I will just hand the session to Raksha just to create you and then she'll be able to start the session. So please remember to be very engaging and um, I fill our chat, uh, chat platform with questions and uh, lots of engagement. Raksha will be able to respond to your question and then we'll, we can put you through if you need to be unmuted and I think we're just going to have a great session. So now I'll just hand over to Raksha. Thank you. Wow, what a glowing intro, Rapala. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is so <laughs> wonderful to connect with all of you again. I cannot believe. Um, it, feels like, it feels like two years ago. That's how much, it feels like that much time has passed since the last time I physically spent time with all of you. I mean, right from the start where we were prepping for this whole process and then doing a bit of a gap analysis towards the end of last year. And now suddenly it feels like we are in an entirely different world. So I'm really humbled to be spending some time with you at the moment. I'm really grateful that a company like Yidi, um, who has at its core, um, core value innovation, is able to pivot and shift and still add value for all of you during this time where so many are in a state of absolute disarray and shock around how to continue business. Um, so lovely that uh, Yidi has created a platform and for us to continue adding value for all of you. I know that you've been a, on a little bit of a journey already with the Propreneur X program. And like Rapelang said, I am all about engagement. So I've been running a couple of webinars of my own and I've been um, having quite a lot of client meetings and you'll see that I'm gonna encourage us to engage a lot more. Um, and I wanna get a sense of really where you are all at. 
So I actually want to start by that. I, I was going to go straight into my presentation, but I actually want to do a quick check-in because we're spending today, we're going to spend a considerable chunk of the day talking about branding and marketing. I want to show you how these pieces of the puzzle fit together to go into sales. So I want to get a sense of where everybody's at. I want to know how you're feeling. I want to know how you're feeling about your brands. I want to know if your head is in a space to take in this information, to truly put in the work that needs to be done around if you have a brand, applying what I'm sharing with you today to assessing, auditing the effectiveness of your brand, or to really start crafting and being open to recreating. I see Ntokoza has a hand raised. Rapilam, do you want to, or will I, um, I don't know if you're unmuting or if we're looking in the chat? Yes, so if they want to talk, then I'll be able to unmute them if they, um, okay, let me see, because I'm just working on it on my phone so I, I suppose i should be able to unmute them let me see can i help can i help Are yeah you can help me from the site okay Ntokozo, i see let's hear what you have to say Some unmute. sometimes our delegates just raise their hands to wave as well <laughs> no no hi everyone i'm actually not trying to wave but i do want to say hi to everyone um i think we are in a space where we're actually trying to recreate our brand right now. Um, I think what we've noticed these couple of weeks when we've just had time to obviously introspect, we've realized that maybe we're not necessarily reaching the target and we're not, our messaging has been lost in translation. What we're trying to say and what our customers are receiving are two different things. So I think that's where we are in terms of our marketing. So we want to definitely use this time to make sure that um, we're creating or messaging the messaging that we're sending out is speaking exactly to what we're doing and obviously we get the reach that we're trying to receive okay that's all lovely thank you thank you i love the engagement and i think that it's so powerful that you're sharing that because whether we like it or not the world has changed around us and almost every single one of us as business owners are reassessing exactly that point now are we still relevant is our brand messaging aligned to where people's mindsets are at so it's a lovely point to go in with and i'll keep that in mind as we share lovely to see the rest of you on the call i see bonolo dipuo gugu paseka peter sipiso smangaliso if there's anything that any of you would like to add or say Cool. If not, I'm going to just uh, share my screen. So give me a second to just swap I think over. Rose put her hand up. I'll just unmute her. Okay. Morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. Morning, Dupo. How I hope everyone is fine. Um, I think on my side, yeah, we obviously a bit anxious with everything not working, not manufacturing, not installing, not doing anything in terms of business. But we've also taken the time to just push some ad admin work, you know, that we never have time to do, um, drawing off some processes, reviewing job des descriptions and all of that. So that's the kind of work that I've been busy with. And in terms of marketing and branding, we've actually been running exciting, um, post on social media about home offices because we're just thinking everybody right now is probably thinking about a home office idea since they're all going to be spending a whole lot more time at home and um, so that's been exciting and then while we're running that series the home office series we're planning on um, putting together some content on you know just common cabinet um, tips how to get rid of scratches water leaks and stuff like that so that's the next series to follow. So that has been our plan in terms of marketing and branding. Thank you. When you say series, what does that mean? What, how are you sharing content? Where are you sharing content? What type um, of content? So mostly on um, Instagram and Facebook. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of posts on one topic. So the topic is home office series. And then we share designs, um, you know, if you've got a small room, a big room, um, yeah, basically things like that. And are you doing static imagery? Are you doing video? Are you varying the type of content that you're creating? Not really at the moment. I haven't done video, but I mean, that's, yeah, that's something to, to think about. Yeah, definitely. That would be exciting, but it's mostly been like um, 3D renderings 
with a couple of angles, uh, but mostly static um, pictures. Okay. Uh, yeah. So good to know. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, good. So, Jesh, will you mute Dipur again and I will swap over? Yep. That's, yeah, so Raksha, maybe also just during the, the session, what you could uh, advise on, uh, not now, but just probably during the session, just as we, um, the guys are in the lockdown, how they can effectively create, continue to increase the, the brand equity by different awareness strategies that they can work on because just like um, Gugu and um, uh, the Kondwanis, they were able to really go out there and make sure that they do a, a webinar on, on Instagram. So those kind of things, they create vibe for the brand and continue to raise awareness and increase the brand equity because there's no much you can do, but there are levers that you can create for your brand while you are locked down because you are not smacked down you are not closed down completely but there are other things and levers that, that you can really pull into your business and i i'm really um raising the kondwani story because they they were really proactive in doing that and i thought that it worked quite well and maybe you can advise the guys on some of the things that they could do while they're in lockdown to continue to increase their brand equity Okay. So, Raksha, before you, you get into that, I just do want to stress that next week we have someone that's going to be focusing on social media because a lot of the gaps, I know you're going to cover marketing and branding, and maybe it's also worth explaining the difference between marketing, branding, and then social media because it is a whole other section that we want to focus on. And uh, we have a specialist that's going to be speaking about increasing your social media brand and how to use social media effectively across Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So when you do touch on it, just don't go into too much detail because okay. we do have a specialist next week that will be covering that topic up along. So that's next week as well. Uh, and for the rest of you, um, and I, the reason I procured the services of a social media specialist is because of the one-on-ones that I've had with most of you, where you indicated that um, it's important to have someone that can help you with your social media and that part of your business. So we definitely want to get into the detail of it to help overcome some of the challenges that you're facing. Okay, so over to you, Raksha. Good, good to know. Thanks, Jesh. Thanks for sharing. So I want to start by playing a video. <laughs> Love it, Ponolo. Excited. That's definitely the space to be excited for because that's one of those, like Rapilang is saying, one of the levers that we can use. So I want to start by playing a video. It's a video that I usually play at the start of every session. And in kind of watching it again yesterday, I thought, is it still relevant? Has our world changed way too much in the last three, four weeks, three months? Um, for this video to be relevant, but I do think that it is. So I'm going to share um, this video with you. Uh, let me quickly get there. Good.
So I do hope that you were able to see that video. Um, Movies and television are constantly. There we go. It, it was an important one for me because even though the world has changed so much in the last month and the last three months, there are some pertinent points in that video that really opened, opens eyes for entrepreneurs into the world that we are building for. And now the situation that we find ourselves in has forced us to, even if we weren't comfortable with the idea of looking to the future and thinking about and understanding how we're building brands and building businesses for the future, now more than ever, that, that is the only question mark hanging above our heads every day in every minute. So I want you to have that thought at the back of your mind throughout this time that we spend together is what am I building for? Who am I building for? And what is the world around them going to look like? What real problem am I going to be solving? So I want to jump in. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Let me screen share again. We kind of went through this first slide a little bit where I wanted to check in with you around how I can help you. So if there's anything else that uh, comes to mind, please put it in the chat box, either Apelang or I will pick up on it so that I ensure that I'm answering those questions or talking to it before our time is over. But what I want to spend this time talking to you about is, first of all, the core of what we are putting out there. So I'm going to skim through the first lot of content pretty quickly because you all have established businesses already. So I want you to apply an auditing mind to it now around how have I named my business? How are people uh, engaging with that name as a result of it? Are people able to quickly understand what it is that I do, et cetera, et cetera. Then we're gonna go into the work of building out a brand. We're gonna then move into some marketing work and we're gonna finish off with a very light intro into sales and showing you how all these three processes work together. So. To start off, I think the best way to learn is to play. So we're going to play a game. And I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen nice and clearly because you're going to be, need to see the screen clearly to play this game with me. So this is what is going to happen. I'm going to bring up a slide. I need you all to please pen and paper um, or on your phones, whatever it is that you're using for the session. If you can please number one below the other numbers, one to 12. I'm going to bring up 12 brands on the screen and I want you to try and identify them as quickly as possible. I'm going to give you one minute to identify as many brands as possible and then we're going to talk about it afterwards. So I want you to take a piece of paper. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do this and write down numbers 1 to 12, one below the other. And then um, raise your hand to let me know when you're ready. And then we are going to go into the game. Good, so I'm getting out my phone because it is a game. I'm going to see how many of you can answer as many brands as possible. I'm taking out my phone to put a timer on and the timer is one minute. I'm going to give you one minute to identify as many brands as possible. Let's go.
We're down to 30 seconds. And we're down to 10 seconds. And your time is up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reveal what these brands are. And I'd like us to please uh, wrap along. If we can please unmute all the participants, I'd like us to have a conversation. So I want you to mark yourselves, people. I want you to tell me who got 12 out of 12. Here we go. So those are our brands. Those are some standard, iconic, strong South African brands. So I want to know, people, tell me who got 12 out of 12. Maybe put it in the chat box for me. Tell me who got 12 out of 12. Tell me who got 11. Tell me who got 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Tell me who got nothing. I want to know how many brands you were able to identify. Whoa, guys, such lovely responses. Google, 9. Spumi, I got 10. Bonolo, 6. Sefiso, 8. Dipo, 9. Paseka, 9. Peter, five. Hi, Peter. I'm happy to have you on board. Lovely to connect with you again. Taboho, six. <laughs> Tokozo, I managed to get 10. Couldn't remember Omo and Black Label. So that's eight then, not 10. <laughs> I love it. So thank you for playing. Thank you for playing with me. Why are we playing this game? Why are we playing this game? I want you to infuse your brain in the space of brand for the rest of our time together this morning. So there's, there's something that happens when you start engaging with brands. And I want you to acknowledge that that is not sitting in the conscious mind. When you engage with the brand, there's so much that starts to happen. This immaculately intelligent brain of ours starts accessing deep, deep, deep into conscious subconscious and unconscious memories and associations that we have created with brands and then it quickly pulls it out and says ah that's omo ah that's steers ah that's nando's ah that's lucky star there is these brands have become so deeply ingrained in our lives they hold such a huge amount of power over us so i want you to apply your mind to this thought when you go shopping for your grocery shopping, which is quite a different thing to do in today's world. But when you would go normally go grocery shopping and you've got your trolley and you're going through aisle to aisle to aisle and deciding what it is that you need to get for the house, there are some purchasing decisions that require absolutely no thought, absolutely no thought. Your hand goes out to the shelf, you pick it up and you put it in the trolley. You may be picking up two or three of that thing and putting it in the trolley. Those purchasing decisions are not conscious. Do you understand the power of a brand when it becomes so deeply ingrained in your purchasing decisions that it's almost an extension of you, it's an extension of your life? I want you to start thinking about what some of those brands are. Are they the type of toothpaste that you use, the soap you use, the washing powder you use, the brand of bread you eat, the brand of milk you buy for the home? It could go into higher value items is it your clothing that you buy your shoes that you buy the type of software that you buy the phone that you use the laptop the technology there is these brands have become so deeply infused in our lives they hold such power over us that they are no longer a conscious purchasing decision i think so visually and i often apply my mind to the thought of a challenge out to you have you ever thought about what happens by the time you, from the time you open your eyes in the morning until the minute you open your front door and you step out for the day? On a normal day, not a lockdown day. So from the time you open your eyes and you lift your head up off that pillow and 
I don't know what the first thing is that you do. If you are reaching for a glass of water, if you are reaching for a chapstick or lip balm, if you are reaching for a cell phone, if you are standing up and swinging your feet down and putting your feet down on, a gr on the ground, have you thought about all those brands that you've engaged with already? Everything that's sitting on your bedside table and the stuff that you reach for. Your feet, as you swing them off the ground, are they going down onto concrete, onto tile, onto wood, onto carpet? The bed that you're getting out of, the pillow that you slept on, whether there's a duvet, whether there's a blanket, whether there's a sheet, there are brand interactions happening there already. Then you stand up and you walk straight into that bathroom. There's a whole world of brands happening in there, from the type of toilet paper that you use to the type of tap that you are turning on when you want water, the toothpaste, the soap, the shampoo, every single brand interaction that you've had, right until the moment that you leave the house for the day. So somebody, somebody needs to be muted. Just drop a lung so you know, you're just getting some feedback. Right until the minute that you leave the house for the day, um, whether you are making breakfast, what that breakfast is all about, whether the TV is on or the radio is on while you are getting the family ready for the day or getting yourself ready for the day to go out. By the time you step out of your front door, you've had hundreds of brand interactions. I'd love for you to switch that on for yourself and just start to decode how many of those brand interactions are no longer even conscious anymore. They are so deeply ingrained into your lifestyle that they are an extension of you. And here we are, business owners deciding, I am going to add my unique brand into the mix of the thousands and millions and billions that exist out there. And I want people to stop in their daily interaction, focus me and choose to do business with me. That is the power of brand, when it becomes ingrained in your life and it is no longer a conscious purchasing decision. And this is why the body of work around building a brand is so gravely important because we have to decode all those things that are no longer conscious for you, all the things that we are doing subconsciously and unconsciously. How are we decoding and intentionally influencing how a consumer, how a client, how a potential client engages with my brand so that it starts to become noticeable, it starts to become repetitive, it starts to become present in their mind, it starts to become a consideration when they are deciding to purchase in this area, then it starts to become the decision and then how does it become the chosen one for every single time they need to make this purchasing decision? So I really want to switch you on to the power of brand and I want you to start decoding how people are engaging with yours. So the first one is definitely your name. I want you to audit the name of your business while we go through these points. Think about whether your name is hard or easy to spell, whether it could be limiting to your business, whether when you conduct a search online, there are other businesses that have similar ones or same ones with a different extension on the domain. Can you own the domain for that business name? Does that business name convey some sort of a meaning? Or is it just a name for the fun's sake of being a name? And is it a name that can be protected once it's built to a point that it needs to be protected? Have you done a CIPC search to see if anyone else has similar stuff, a similar name close to you? Is it catchy? Have you tested that name out with your audience? And when I say your audience, I don't mean just your family and your friends who love you and want to keep telling you that everything that you do is brilliant and wonderful. Have you tested it out with a good objective audience who will give you the feedback around whether or not it is doing a service in selling or explaining what it is that you do? Some names look very good when they're written down. Does the name sound good when it's spoken? Um, and if it isn't, there are lots of resources to brainstorm the names. And at the end of the day, the most important one is for you to truly be happy about it. Because if you are using a business name that doesn't resonate for you, you're never going to sell it with the same passion and enthusiasm as something that you would be happy with. So I want to invite you to do these two tests on your business name. It's the smile and the scratch test. So I want you to, to, to audit your business name around whether it's simple, it's easy to understand, whether it's meaningful. Is there some meaning into it that a customer can get very quickly? Does it lend itself to a visual space? We know that people consume information visually now more than ever. That is why pictures, photographs, and videos have become the biggest form of uh, content that is being consumed. So does that business name lend itself to some beautiful imagery? Can I see in my mind what this business does when I read its business name? 
Does it have legs? Can it carry into other things as the business grow and evolves? And does it evoke an emotional response that people can start to connect with? For the scratch test, I want you to think about the spelling of the name. Is it something that is very complex for people to try to understand? If you are on the phone with someone and you're saying, send me an email to raksha at blah, 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 dot co dot za, is it easy for them to understand what it is that you're saying? Are there, are there lots of copycats in the marketplace, people with similar names? Is it too random? Is your name so random from what it is that you do that people find it too hard to connect the name with the service or the product that you're offering? Is there an annoying hidden meaning? So have you searched it to find out if it could be misinterpreted? And especially in the South African context, when we have so many official languages, um, we really need to test it across all the different cultures. Is it too tame? Is it flat? Is it uninspiring? Is it boring? Does it say, I just sell cupboards? Um, this is a common one that happens with industry players. Is there a curse of knowledge around it? Which means, are we using jargon in our business name that only players in our industry can get? And is it hard to pronounce? I had a friend, a beautiful friend, who had a copywriting business where she was writing content. And the name of her business was Confab Agility. And I said to her, what on earth does that mean? And can I say it? Maybe me as a first language English speaker can eventually get used to saying the word confab agility but how's everybody else across this country going to keep saying call so and so from confab agility so is it something that is easy to pronounce and doesn't rely too heavily on punctuation so business name now we're going to jump right back into brand so I want you to understand that a brand is it's a unique space so there are so many people doing what we do, especially myself. I mean, I run a design, branding, and marketing agency, and I could become completely paralyzed with fear when I think about how many people do what I do just in my physical location or radius, just in a five kilometer radius from where I live. If I do a search, I will find a number of people doing what I do, and that could be paralyzingly fearful. But the key to brand is uniqueness. What is the unique space that I'm claiming in a client's mind? And when it comes to brand, I'm not necessarily talking about, am I so unique that I um, am an Uber or an Airbnb? But is there a unique story that I've created around my brand that people can relate with or resonate with or connect with or find quirky or interesting that that becomes unique. Ah, that's the summertime story. Ah, Raksha's the beat at summertime. Is there a uniqueness that's associated with them? And do I create a lovely story connecting it for them that I become memorable? So that story has got to associate your product or your service with their personal lives. So what personal problem are you solving for me that makes you relevant and more memorable for me? And then how can that brand be easily represented in visual symbols? So if my business name is something like Uber, which is not even a real word, what visual symbols am I creating to help people to understand what it is that the business does? That's the first level to understanding what branding is. On the next level, we get to the really practical aspects around it. So it's the business basics of answering the who you are, the what you do, the way you do it, the who you do it for, the how you do it, and the why you do it. So too often, too often brands leave out the basics. So I, I use this example when I'm in the classroom, that the rate at which we consume information right now is this, so if you can all see my cell phone, this is the rate at which we consume information, at a scrolling rate, at a scrolling rate. So if something is not compelling or interesting enough for me to stop, to create lag, to create a delay, so that I wanna stop and look at it a little bit longer before going to option two and option three, then I'm losing my audience. So a part of that for me is ensuring that we cover the basics. So I don't know about you, but when I'm looking for a new product or service, I do a search and I'll open five or six competitor tab pages to see and compare who it is that I want to be talking to and what their offerings are. So I open, I open, I open, I open all the tabs and I'm looking for these basics. I'm looking for who you are. I'm looking for what you do. 
I'm looking for where you service these clients. I'm looking for who are the people behind this thing that have created this thing um, that add the value or bring their uniqueness to what it is that I'm looking for. I'm looking for how they do it and I'm looking for why they do it. And very quickly, if I'm not getting that basic bit of information at a quick intro section, I am closing that tab and I'm onto the next tab. Close that tab and I'm onto the next tab. And the one who's giving me the comprehensive information that I'm needing, that's the one that I'm going to get, engage with further. So I want you to really put yourself in the shoes of what people are needing, in the shoes of the people who are needing your product or service. And I want you to think about, am I supplying them with the basic information that they need to gauge whether or not I'm the right person to do this for them? So I may find a great company who services and provides all this, the, the, the service offering with all the touch points that I need, but I don't know if they service me in Gauteng. I don't know if they service me in Johannesburg. I don't know if they only have an operation that services clients locally in Cape Town, for example. So make sure that the basics are happening when you are developing a brand. Good. Once we've done this work around thinking about the story that we want to create and answering all the basics, the five key elements, and um, recently I took myself back to school, and after running the business for 12 years, um, went to go and study brand and marketing management again. And it was so fascinating for me to look at how and if the space has changed. And this world is evolving. I mean, even this branding and marketing world has evolved hugely. And the way a business builds their brand and markets themselves today is vastly different to the way it was done when we start our, started our business 13 years ago. And this is an article by, by Porter, Adrian Porter. And I love the five elements of defining a brand. And this speaks to now the last point on the previous slide, which is the why. Simon Sinek did that famous um, TED talk called Start With Why. So if you haven't watched it, go out and look for uh, a TEDx, a TED talk by Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, called Start With Why. And he talks about this golden circle. And basically in that talk, he says, at the end of the day, people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. And that's the first point really on the slide is what is your purpose behind creating this brand and this business? Why do you exist? So I know that it's a problem that people need their interiors done in their properties or people need to find a suitable property for whatever it is that they need done. But why? Why do you exist? Why are you the right person to talk to in solving this problem for them? And I'm not necessarily speaking about you as the entrepreneur. That's a wonderful thing to tap into your unique skill set that you bring into the business. But why this business? Because we're looking at the brand now. Why this brand to solve this problem for you? What is unique in this brand's methodology or in the reason for this brand existing that drives it more? I'll give you an example. When I was um, running masterclasses for the Brands Center of Entrepreneurship, which is interestingly where Rappi Lang and Jayshree and I met a good couple of years ago, and we had started working on all of this entrepreneurial development work. We met a young entrepreneur and she was developing natural hair care products for ethnic hair. And now it's really common practice. But a good couple of years ago, it was lovely to see and there was newness in the marketplace when, when this specific need was being taken care of. We knew that it was a, re a real problem. But I love when, when her brand story came out and she said her why. There was such a deep connection with it that it stayed for me for six years now where she said her daughter, her daughter had the most beautiful natural hair and she was this gorgeous little girl and she used to wash her hair and want it to just be in its natural state. And when she looked out for product to um, nourish uh, her daughter's hair, the product that she was buying was not suitable for her specific hair type. And as a result, it ended up damaging her daughter's hair. It ended up giving her rashes and eczema. And she had a very serious personal story linked into her why around developing this business offering and the specific product. And it tied in so, on such a real level, for her reason for this business to exist. There was a very strong why linked to her personal story. And as a result, the, the energy, the nature, the commitment, the realness with which she brought into every aspect of the business, from the brand building, to the product development, to the marketing, to the packaging, to the, to the 
client and community engagement, ensuring that it was really solving their need was on an entirely different level. So I really want you to put some thought into why are you choosing to do what you do? Why do you exist and why do you matter as a brand in doing it? When we go on to number two and we talk about brand positioning, this is where we really are going to get into that unique space that you want to claim in a client's mind for your target audience and the marketplace. And what this means is it's a lot of pressure. I remember when I was starting my business and everyone said, oh, you have to have uniqueness. You have to have uniqueness. You have to have uniqueness. And there was such a lot of pressure for us because we're a service-based business and our skills are in marketing strat and brand strat and brand development and graphic design, copywriting, and web development. How do you make that unique? And over the years, it was so nice for me. And it was also a lot of a lot of the education and training that I exposed myself to with people like Jay Shri, who, who taught us around these concepts of innovation and incremental innovation and all of these wonderful things that said, you don't have to be that claiming that unique space in terms of your offering. Your uniqueness could come in how you deliver your offering or the unique team complement that brings that skill and that unique industry background into how you deliver your offering. So start thinking there as well around uniqueness in terms of what you bring, uh, a unique audience that you wanna be targeting, a unique offering that you wanna be targeting, or a unique methodology or way in which you deliver something that someone else is delivering as well that may add value. The next point is to get real about what your promise is. What is the guarantee of value that you are giving to your audience? What is that unique promise? And in a South African context, people are not doing this enough. And even if they are doing it, people are not delivering on it enough. So this is a wonderful opportunity for you to really claim that position with a promise that you consistently deliver on. Then you really wanna to get to your brand personality. And this is where you almost wanna give your brand a persona. So if your brand were a person, what would they be like? Would they be youthful and spunky and lively? Would they be a little bit more centered and serious and engaging? Uh, would they be confident? Would they be fun? So what would the tone of your brand be like? What would the personality of it be like? Because this is now going to inform everything that you put out, whether it's visual, whether it's verbal, whether it's written, everything is going to have a tone to it. And this is 100% aligned to the unique brand personality that you want to give it. So I, I also want to just make a point here when we talk about brand personality, that I don't want you to confuse professionalism and a compromise of professionalism if you do decide to take the route that isn't serious. So my brand, for example, has a lot of fun. It has a lot of lightness. It has a lot of quirkiness in it. If you were in a classroom with me, by now I would have definitely sung a song. You would have gotten up and did a whole lot of engagement with me as well. There is a quirkiness and a fun aspect to the personality that we have in the Summertime brand. But in absolutely no way does that compromise the level of professionalism, the level of commitment that we bring when engaging with a client. When I send emails out to any level of person within an organization, whether it is at CEO level or any other level within the organization, if I feel like putting a smiley in the body of that email, I put a smiley in the body of that email. That's how I choose to engage as a brand personality for summertime. So I'm not saying that you need to do this. What I'm saying is you need to apply your mind to thinking about what your unique brand personality is for your business and how confident you put that across in all various forms of comms um, and how approachable a personality really exists, a brand persona exists to make your brand human and approachable and create a space through which you can connect with people. So that's personality. And lastly, at the end of this is now where we are getting into brand identity. Because when I ask the question, and I would have if we were in a classroom, a physical classroom environment, I would have asked the question, what brand is for you? And so often the answer is my brand is my website. My brand is my logo. My brand is my business card. My brand is the color palette that I use. My brand is my Facebook page. And those are merely the visual elements of everything that we have discussed up until this point. So if you have done all your homework properly, if you have done all the background work properly that you need to be doing, once you get into this point where you are either briefing a creative team to develop a brand identity, or whether you are developing it yourself, or whether you are auditing what you have already developed as a brand identity, 
the depth and the scope and the quality of that brief and the information that you've worked on up until now will dictate the depth and the scope and the quality of what you've produced as output or what your creative team will produce as output. It's only as good as the information that you put into it. And if you've done all the work we've talked about up until now, then you'll get to a point where visually your brand is representing accurately what it is that you want to be talking about. So the five key elements that define a brand. So Seth Godin is a marketing brand and marketing guru. And um, if you want to learn a little bit more in the space, if you want to spend some time just, um, yeah, consuming content to just help you do this better for your business, he uses this definition. A brand is a set of expectations, memories, stories, and relationships that taken together account for a consumer's decision to choose one product or service over another. And I love this definition. And I often think to myself that when I run this masterclass, I could really just leave this definition up and talk everything else out of this definition. Because what it does is it gives us a beautiful to-do list where we now go back and we work on as a brand, as a business, what have I put out there that is creating specific expectations for a client. So what expectation have I created for a client? Have I created an expectation for a client that when they engage with me for a quotation on their interiors or for sourcing a suitable property for them, or sourcing a suitable solution for them, have I created the expectation that I'm the best person to speak to for this? Have I created the expectation that I am a professional at this? Have I created the expectation that my team has experience, has the necessary knowledge, has the necessary networks, has the necessary skills to give them the best solution possible. Next, we go on to memories. So in engaging with my business to date, whether it's in digital spaces, whether it's in direct spaces, what memories have I created for people aligned to my brand already? When they get an email from me, what does it look like? When they get a quotation, a proposal, when they get a phone call from me, what do I sound like? Um, what is my job title? Are there unique memories that they are starting to associate with my brand? Aligned to that is definitely stories. So do they have a story associated with my brand? Is my story in each of your minds now that Raksha was the lady who ran the masterclass on the Propreneur X um, program for branding and marketing? Is that your story that you are always going to associate with Raksha? What relationships am I building as a business? So how do I build relationships? When I engage one-on-one -on -one with a potential new client, what's my style for building rapport with them? What's my style for connecting as a human being with them? How am I building relationships with them? And it's, it's such a beautiful thing because it's human connection. And this is where the focus is so heightened at the moment because every single one of us has to communicate through the screen of technology. Um, the way in which we are connecting is really heightened. So as brands now, all eyes are on us as businesses to look at how are we navigating these times? How are we still showing our clients that we are still there? And how are we maintaining these connections? And all of these things, all of these things distill down at the end of the day for it accounts for that consumer, that potential client choosing you over another. So it's reverse engineering the whole process. So that was what I wanted to share with you on brand. Jayshree said to me that um, when we run these really long masterclasses, we should take a break every hour or so. But before we take a break, I want to just open it up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And before we kind of move into the marketing aspect, I want to ask you, if any of you have any questions, any comments, anything that you want to add now on the brand content specifically. After that, what we're going to do is we're going to take a five to 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and we're going to jump into marketing. So I want to open it up, guys. Let's talk and let's reflect on everything from the game that we played around identifying brand, from looking at the conscious, the unconscious and the subconscious things that we, that we now need to consciously plant in a client's mind. And then um, some of those practical things around the what, where, why, when, who, how around building a brand. Let's have a quick conversation for the next few minutes.
So Rapilang, I know that everyone is muted. I don't know if you want to ask them to put their hands up and then we'll... Um... Yeah, I think there's a question from Bonolo. So um, yeah, I can unmute you guys if you need to talk or you need to uh, put your question on the chat, then uh, we can address it. But if you specifically need to be unmuted, just let us know, then we can unmute you. Can I ask, please, Bonolo, that we unmute you? Because I do like talking and connecting. So if we unmute you, even if you uh, put the video on so I can see you, um, let's uh, talk. Hi, can you hear me, Raksha? I can. Yeah. Hi, everyone else. Um, yeah, so in terms of the brand personality, by, by the way, this session has been brilliant, so thank you. Um, and in terms of the brand personality, often we want to portray a certain image in our brands, either to be taken seriously or to be seen as professional, credible, whatever the case may be. Um, but obviously we have our own personalities. So to what degree do those need to align? Such a beautiful question. I love it. Thank you. Thanks, Fanola. Thanks for that question. Um, there's two things. So firstly, there is the aspect of a personal brand, and we haven't spoken about that, but that's, I'll just go very quickly. So your personal brand is already being built. It's out there, it's existent in the marketplace already. Whether you know it or not, whether you are consciously crafting it or not, a personal brand has already been aligned with you. It is what people say about you when you are not in the room. It's what people say about you when another person asks another person about you. So that personal brand is already being built. Then there's a number of personalities that come together to then form a business brand. And there is a persona that we want to create around the business. We want it to be professional. We want it to be experienced. We want it to be maybe the game changer, the innovator, the, new, the newbie who is bringing out the newest technologies. Whatever it is that you want that brand persona to be. Um, the key, the key around it, Bonolo, is authenticity. So if you are going to project something that you realistically are not right now, then you're going to do the brand detriment. And people are so smart, you know, now more than ever, now more than ever in the history of time, people have access to information like never before. And people have an assumption and an expectation of access to information. So it's like, it's like, I expect that you as a business is going to give me all this information about you. Um, and that expectation of mine is met because it is now forming my opinion or my understanding or my judgment. Realistically, it's a judgment. It's not a bad thing. I make a judgment on whether this business is credible or not. I make a judgment on whether I want to engage with you further or not. Um, they make that judgment based on a combined personality for the brand. So the key here is as a team to decide and decode what the persona of the brand needs to be and be a hundred percent credible and authentic. Because if we are saying that we are the game changing fire starting innovators, but we are still delivering what the market was delivering 12 years ago, then you'll know very quickly that your market is going to sniff out and that you're going to start losing credibility. You're going to lose brand equity. You're going to lose market share very quickly. So the answer really is to um, be credible, be authentic about it. And uh, it will start to connect. It will start to create those connections between the individual personal brands and the business brand as a whole, the persona. Paseka, do you want to unmute and talk to me? It's a nice long question, Paseka. So maybe speak okay. it. All right. Hi, Raksha. And hey. everyone else. Am I audible? Yes, talk a little louder. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I really love the definition that you placed there uh, regarding the, the, the ideal definition of a brand. Uh, it spoke volumes, and it got me wondering if your business is product oriented, you're creating and you're producing, and each product has to access the market with a bang, and often than not, has to have a brand. So when you are the business, would you put emphasis on the brand of the business or the brand of the product? And if so, which one do you place emphasis on if you're doing both to which intensity in order to, to meet the objective as per your ideal definition of the brand? 
Thanks, Paseka. Another really smart question. I love it. Um, I, and I know that you were breaking up a little bit with your connection. So I'm just going to reiterate the question. So if your business is product orientated, so there's this initial need to build a business brand, but then if we are building our products, uh, where should the focus be? Should it be pushing the brand of the product or of the business or both? And if so, to which intensity do you place on each to ensure the objective is met as per your ideal definition of the brand? That's a lovely question. And it's almost like, it's really speaking to, and I don't want to get stuck in the jargon, but it's speaking to brand strategy and it's speaking to brand architecture. So brand strategy, first of all, will almost speak to a brand strategy aligns to the strategy for the business. So inevitably, when I end up doing a brand strategy, I consult on a business's whole strategy because we have to understand what the short term, long term goals and visions are for the business. So the brand strategy will align to the business strategy. And as a basis, as a foundation and a basis, you must must do the work to build the brand, the business brand first. It's the home, it's the umbrella under which everything lives and it brings the credibility and authenticity to everything that you do. So you must build out, do the basics, get all the basics in place so that people understand, uh, people can engage. There's an aeroplane flying over, so I just don't want to compete with it. There we go. So that people engage and that people um, know and can get the basics of what they need to get. The stuff that I spoke to you about, where we're not frustrating people by not giving them the basic information around the business brand. Then if the business strategy is to launch strong products, one strong product, I don't know, one strong product once a year or every six months, I don't know what your frequency is. Then those become sub brands of the main brand. And this is where I'm talking about this concept of brand architecture. So there's a primary brand at the top and then there's a secondary brand at the bottom. And then we start looking at how we are introducing additional brands. So you, again, this answer will come aligned to your business strategy. So if the business strategy is to build out these strong products that you want to stand independent of the business brand because you may want to sell it along the line or you may want to um, collaborate with another business brand that's going to take it off into a JV somewhere. I don't know. But the answer to this question lies in your business strategy, your long-term view, and again, um, how those actual structures are working around it. Um, but if everything is to sit within your business for the foreseeable future, it would be in your best interest to invest some good time and energy into building out that strong business brand as the foundation from which you start building things on top. So I hope that answers your question. Um, if you have a follow-up question, let me know. Uh, if anybody else has another question on the brand side, please let me know. Uh, Ntokoza, you were talking about your brand messaging and your reach. Have you had any thoughts while I was sharing this? Anything you want to ask as a follow-on? While we're there, uh, Raksha, uh, maybe while we are going to be getting Ntokoza on, so maybe we can just take a break for now. And then, um, yeah, so then right away when, when we come back, then we can just take into Tokoso, just so that we can break for about 10 minutes and then we will come back. Sure, Rapilang. Let's take a break then. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you, guys. So we are back at quarter past. So it's uh, uh, five past 10 now. So by quarter past, we just have to be back. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Raksha. Yeah, we are good. Yeah, we're good. We are good to start. The guys are back. So, yeah, I think we can continue the session. And then let's just see if Ndokozo is back. Then maybe um, you can engage her. Hi, guys. Yes, I'm back. Oh, I can't hear you. Let's hear from you. Um, hi, thank you, Raksha, but for that. Um, I think when you definitely went through everything, I was able to just check some boxes and see where we are. I noticed when I was actually having a conversation with Google Offline as well. We've, I think what we've managed to do with our branding, we've definitely figured out the, the brand purpose, the positioning of our business in terms of um, our unique space and the promise. But I think what I've picked up is that maybe what's not translating is the business personality. 
we are when you said you we should give it a persona which then brings me back to our brand identity our logo tagline and all those things i think our the disconnect here is we don't necessarily have a personality per se we have my personality and we have google's personality but we haven't necessarily figured out what the personality of the business is we know what we do we know our prop, our position and we know the promise that we to, we intend on delivering but that's what we haven't figured out and i think as a result we're not necessarily we're not necessarily communicating that and i think what what we needed to figure out now or what we are agreeing on that maybe the disconnect lies within that is our logo has been just kondwani and the reason why we did that initially is because we didn't necessarily want to ring fence ourselves because we do want to do other things in the built environment space however uh we don't want to confuse our clients that we have right now because we're thinking for the future so it's how do we find that middle ground that this is what i'm trying to communicate right now because this is what i'm doing right now but ultimately we don't want to have a name like kondwani fence when three years down the line from now we do other things and then it just confuses our clients or our target audience like what are you doing are you doing the fencing just the fencing or are you doing other stuff in the building so i think that's where we're trying to yeah okay i hear you i just want to leave you with three points to think about right so when you talk about the brand persona and then you talk about the visual identity the logo etc etc just remember we 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 separated those two things hey and the one informs the other so the brand persona i want you to think about if the brand were a person what would they be like how would they dress what would their tone be like what would their style be like how would they communicate all of that stuff so think about the brand persona and then how that translates into your brand identity and then also think about um i hear and understand and it's a common one with us as entrepreneurs because for those of us who are wired to be entrepreneurs we wired to constantly solve problems and watch the world and pivot and innovate and create solutions and create products and so we we don't often don't want to ring fence ourselves too tightly but having said that in ring fencing yourself you speak to a specific niche and you know that feeling when you're out there in the world and you're engaging with a product or service and you go oh my god they're talking to me they are talking to me they know that this is my problem i'm not even thinking about it i'm going to buy it like all these fruit and veggie home delivery companies that have popped up now during lockdown i mean for those of us who are saying that we want to adhere to social distancing and would prefer not to have to go into a supermarket if we don't we know that they are talking to me so those businesses that are speaking specifically to you that are solving a problem the reason why you have that deep connection with that brand is because it is so targeted and it is so to use your word it's so ring fenced so think about your strategic long and short term goals for the business and how is it going to do you a service or a disservice right now to solve for this now and then you can get creative around business structures and brand um structures and architecture to add on to it at a later stage so i want i want you to think there i'm going to leave it there for now and we could definitely talk about it if you want any of you if you want to talk about it one on one just reach out i want us to move over into the marketing aspect so let me go back into screen sharing and bring up the next round of slides good good so this is where we left off and now i want us to really start talking about marketing and it is such a interesting thing for me because yeah this year we've been in business for 13 years and every engagement that i still have with my my clients my sme clients uh is around them coming to me and saying i need help with marketing and i go okay what do you need help with oh no i need help with marketing well what does that mean to you and it's i love this opportunity to really share this knowledge because the more informed you are when you ask for that you're going to know what percentage of the work you as the business owner would have needed to have done up until now in order to inform a good marketing outcome so when you go to an external party or agency or company or whatever and say do my marketing i want you to have a reality check that a huge amount of that work needed to have happened with you internally very much like the brand before you go and you brief an agency so 
whenever a company comes to me and asks me, um, I need help with my marketing and I say, what are we, what are we marketing? We inevitably go back to brand because I need to know what we are marketing. So inevitably, every marketing request of my, to me becomes a brand audit first. Because if I'm going to start driving traffic and driving people into your channels to start engaging with your business, inevitably they're gonna land in your brand space and your brand space needs to be accurately reflecting everything about your business, about your who, what, why, when, how, all of that stuff. Um, so we start with brand. Anyway, the American Marketing Association calls marketing the process of generating customer interest in your product or service, it generates the strategy that underlies everything, your sales techniques, your business communication, your new business development, and it's an integrated process through which you build strong customer relationships and create values, value for your customers and for themselves. So I really want you to start decoding this this concept of how am I creating customer interest? And it all goes back to the problem that you are solving and how uniquely you are talking to that specific target market around solving that problem. So we spent the last hour talking about brand where we have been sitting in our shoes. I am business owner. I'm sitting here in my shoes and I'm saying I'm developing a brand and I'm telling you everything about me. I'm telling you all about my education, my experience, my professionalism, my knowledge, my networks, my team, my offering, my uniqueness. I'm sitting here telling you all about me. Now I want you to take yourself out of your shoes and put yourself into the shoes of your potential customer or client. Everything we do in marketing efforts has to do with them. What it is that they are looking for, how are we satisfying their needs, and how am I getting in front of them? them so that they know that I'm the person to solve that problem for them. So brand, I'm creating all this beautiful content and I'm pulling people to engage with my content and see who I am. But marketing, I'm pushing messaging out to people so they engage with it and they know that I'm the person that they need to come to to solve that problem for them. An important aspect of marketing is to acknowledge that it's a two-way street. Marketing is about creating community, conversation, and engagement. When you put yourself in front of a potential customer or client, I don't want to be standing here and shouting at you. I'm wonderful. I'm trustworthy. I'm selling value. I'm the go-to person. I'm the best person to talk to about this thing. I need to share a bit of information and I need to create channels for us to start having an engagement. So marketing is that beautiful, beautiful space between brand and sales where I'm creating channels to encourage engagement between a client. So it needs to intrinsically, deeply understand what the customer needs and show how we're giving it to them. So I'm sure every single one of us has done some sort of marketing something in our lives. Um, if we haven't in school, in education, when you launch a business and you think about, I have to do some marketing, traditional marketing spaces will tell you that you have to go and look at the marketing mix. And what is the marketing mix? It's a very um, it is the space from which this whole world of marketing began that said, if you want to engage in marketing activities, you need to understand these core four P's that are in front of you on the screen. And that is understanding, first of all, and breaking down everything about what it is that you are selling, that product or that service. Understand every single aspect about that product or, or that service. Is it available only in purple? Is it also available in green? Can it be tweaked? Can it be changed? Um, how does it look? Where is it manufactured? Is it being produced locally? Who are the people that are doing it? So everything to understand and decode your product or your service. Then we look at the place. The place, so places around where we are distributing this product or service. So the places where I need to be marketing this product or service. Where can I put it in front of people so that they know that it exists and that it's something that they need? Then we are going to look at the very important price of it. So decoding and understanding all the aspects of the cost of production of this product or service, the cost of um, our competitors. So the competitor analysis around the landscape of our market. So are there other people who are doing what we do and how are they pricing it? 
and then coming to a place of absolute comfort for how we are uniquely pricing it. So this pricing of your whole offering becomes a part of the marketing mix. The final P of promotion, I'm going to leave for last. So this was the traditional marketing mix that existed years ago when the concept of marketing was first introduced to the world and we needed a methodology for putting this body of work into place. Now, as our world has rapidly evolved, this marketing mix has grown and it has expanded. So now what you see in front of you is an expanded marketing mix that is in response to the world that we live in. So people have, I was saying to you earlier on, people have access to information like never before. So there is all this information that they have access to starts informing and influencing their purchasing decision. You hear what I'm saying? So now that I have access to a website where I can quickly go and see, uh, oh, these are the people in the business and maybe I don't have all the information about the people in the business. I'll go and Google them. I'll go and search for them on LinkedIn. I'll go and search for them on other networking sites. I'll go and ask about them in my different networks. I now have an expectation of knowledge around the people who make up that business, which starts to influence my purchasing decision around whether or not I want to do business with this specific brand. So people becomes an in it's, it's an integral part of your marketing mix. Um, now more than ever, people are doing business with people. Um, especially, I think, more so during this pandemic right now, where we want to get a sense of how are you reacting to it? How, uh, how is it affecting you as a human being? How is it affecting you as a result of it? How is it then infusing into affecting your business? So... As we become more hyper-connected with technology, hyper-connected with social media, I know and I sense it so strongly in the world that I live in that now more than ever, people are craving human connection. So use this to your advantage in your marketing mix. Um, how are you lifting the veil around who the people are that make up this business? So that has become an expectation. So we've spoken product, place, price, people. The next one is process. And I'll always use this example because it's a lovely one. And for me, it, 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 it encompasses the point around this. So there, there's a supplier that we use on a regular basis. And um, I'll give you the full example. So I don't, I don't sell myself as a gifting company, but as an extension of what we offer in a marketing support role, for example, if we're putting a launch event together, a client may say to us, okay, you've built the brand create the, the launch event that we need to be doing to launch the brand to the market. And as a result of that, what's the gifting items that we need to put into the launch? So inevitably, Summertimes has built a network of gifting suppliers. So I would put this out to my network of gifting suppliers to ask for ideas, ask for costing, et cetera. I'll put it out to a minimum of four people and I look at the responses that I get. And inevitably, I keep engaging with this one company because I love process. I as a human being, I absolutely love order, structure, logic, process, to-do lists, ticking. Like, I absolutely love that. So when a company came back to me with a clear process in terms of ordering, I was just blown away. And I'll tell you how they did it. It was so clever and it was so simple. So they would send an email to me, the, the woman that I was engaging with on the sales team. And in her email signature, she had a little graphic. It looked like an infographic, but it's actually a process graphic. And it starts with the process. Um, query received, uh, quotation submitted, um, quotation approved, deposit paid, in production, balance invoiced, balance paid, dispatch and delivery. So it had these different sections. Oh, it had branding. So the branding um, was submitted. Branding approval, branding. So it had that whole like very um, tangible operational process aspect revealed to me as the client. So this whole graphic was gray. And every time I got an email from her, that section where we were at was popping in color. So she didn't need to tell me if I would ask her a question or if she was now sending me an invoice or sending me a balance invoice. Every time she wrote back to me, uh, I would see where I was at in the process. And I absolutely loved it. This is an internal operational thing, which we often want to hide from our clients to say, actually, it's going to take me 
three working days to produce your cupboards or whatever it is that I make. But uh, to buy myself time, I'm going to say that it takes a minimum of seven working days to produce it. It's so beautiful that this company used its internal process and made it visible. They may actually be doing it in two hours, but their process shows that it takes two days. But as the client, I loved getting to see where we were at in the process. And it became a marketing tool. It's absolutely 100% a marketing tool because it created a unique space in my mind. It created a memory. It created a story that I now tell in every masterclass that I run. So I want you to think about your internal processes. I'm not saying that you have to do this. I'm inviting you to explore it as an option around your marketing. Think about your internal processes. Think about anything unique. I mean, we have a unique way in which we quote people. We have a unique way in which we brief. So when we are onboarding a new client, the way in which we do a briefing with a new client is unique to summertime. We've created unique briefing processes and documents that we've designed in our 12, 13 years of existence now that no other business is going to have. So that's a uniqueness that we've built into process that becomes part of our marketing. So I really want you to apply your mind into that, the process P of marketing. And process ties very beautifully into the next P, which is productivity. So productivity speaking as an extension on process into how we are translating that into the productivity of the business in a marketing message. And you could really benchmark this against what your competitors are doing in the space. So where a competitor may say, I need, uh, I'll, give, I'll use my business as an example, where a competitor may say, if I'm taking on a new brand or marketing project, I need a three hour strategy session with you. And I need us to all come into a room. We need to clear a morning out and uh, we need to work on the strategy. For example, a productivity aspect that I may use in my business would be to say, I'm digitizing this process and I'm running it as, for example, a game. How do I gamify my process to increase productivity tie into a clever process and create uniqueness from a branding perspective. So that's an idea that I'm sharing with you. So I want you to think about your productivity in your business and how you could lift the veil on it and make it accessible, visible to people and use it and craft it around specific marketing message. Hmm. So physical environment is the next P. So for physical environment, um, we spoke about place. Places around where your manufacturing happens, places on way, around where your distribution happens as an operational aspect of your business. When we talk about physical environment, and this becomes such a big topic right now in the world that we're living in now, because in November 2018, I closed my offices down and my business partner and I made the decision to run a completely location independent virtual business. So we had spent by that time 11 years building a traditional business model, doing three office moves, building out the office environment to the way it needs to look and coming from a corporate world, we had this idea of how office must look and how um, it's an extension of your brand and it creates a perception of professionalism for your business. I am not saying that that is not important. There is definitely a space for that still in the world. And going into the new world, we'll have to see how that varies from industry to industry. But now this world has been shaken and physical environments become quite different. So I want you to think about how you are engaging with clients in different physical environments and how you could use that potentially for uniqueness and marketing. So a lot of it is happening in spaces like this, where we are Zooming, uh, where we are creating and using tools like Google Tools, um, Google Teams, Google Hangouts, uh, Microsoft Teams, etc. Think about your physical environment and how you are still using it to leverage your marketing well. And now more than ever, it could really be used for unique positioning, for differentiation. It could tie into your productivity, your process conversations. So start to decode all of this stuff and decide what it is going to be for your business. I'm sure quite a few, a few of you have been working in this way already. Um, I see a question pop in. Rapalang, do you want to just read it for me? Because I'm in full screen mode and I don't want to come out of it. Okay, let me just go to it. Um, just give me a second. 
All right, uh, is in Tokozo who says that relating to the productivity bit and the option of digitizing, I have an idea around that uh, that I would like to discuss with you when you get a chance. Thank you. So I think she just want to talk to you offline. Okay, very nice. Good to know. Thank you, thank you. Let's chat about it offline. And I also love how um, Dipur was sharing her, um, the home office series and how beautifully that's exactly what she's done is taken physical environments relevant to her physical environments relevant to her target market and created marketing material out of that so that's really where i want you to apply your mind your physical environment physical environment from which your client is operating and the reality that a huge percentage of you are working in the property space which talks to physical environment so there's endless opportunities for you to start generating conversation and engagement around this topic Good. So I have left the last P for last very intentionally, and I'm not even going to get into it yet. What I want to say to you is I want you to look at the screen and look at all the other P's around promotion. Look at price, product, place, people, process, productivity, and physical environment. I want you to just have a reality check that before you even delve into promotion, you need to have done some good committed work in going deep into all of these other P's. Because it's only once you've done the work around all these other P's that once you get into promotion, can you brief it well? Because promotion really is the one where the client comes and calls me up and says, I need help with my marketing. That is where the agency, the company, or whether you're doing it on your own, this is where the promotion aspect comes up. So once you've done all of this work, it distills down into your promotion space. So what is promotion? And I usually draw a picture, and it's a beautiful left-handed, very untidy, squiggly looking umbrella. So at the top is the umbrella, and that umbrella is marketing. And underneath that umbrella are a whole lot of things that sit that are all the different aspects of what we call, what people traditionally assume is marketing. When you talk about advertising, when you talk about social media, when you talk about face-to-face -face engagements, when we talk about events, when we talk about going live on Insta, all of these different things now sit under the promotion aspect of marketing. So once we've done all the different aspects in, it's informing our promotional activities well. Once we understand who our target market is, once we understand what the uniqueness in our offering is, once we understand what our unique persona and brand is, we know who we're talking to, how we're talking to them. Now with promotion, we look at where we want to be talking to them. Where are those places that we want to get in front of them to start engaging directly? And this is where quite a lot of strategic thinking needs to come in, in terms of, um, aligning it to your business strategy, aligning it to the goals and visions for the business, and then having a deep dive into that target market to truly understand where they play and making sure that you are seen there. And not just seen in a shouting content way, but this whole world of marketing has really, it's such a beautiful evolution where it's become an engagement, a communication, and sometimes even a co-creation where a business may need to pivot and you engage your audience to start co-creating whatever that is. That is such a smart marketing tool. So that is the new marketing mix, people. Um, what I want to do is just look into the difference between branding and marketing. We've been talking about this. I want you to really see it in front of you, and I want you to start making this distinction in your mind because I truly want you to start auditing your activity in the space. Have you up until now only been doing work in brand? Have you till now only been doing work in marketing and very superficially did brand? And maybe you need to go back and visit there and do a proper audit and go in deeper. Or have you been doing superficial work in marketing? So I really want you to start thinking about it. The branding is the why, the marketing is the how. The branding is your long term. Long term, branding is who I am forever. They may, they may just be a tweak or an edit or a shift in brand. If something changes in the market like it is right now, if something changes with your audience, if something changes internally in the business, if you want to go to a new geographical location, if you want to pivot to product, whatever, some of that branding will change, but it is ongoing and it is there forever. 
but your marketing is short, sharp term, quick, sexy. I'm running a three week buy one, get one free campaign. I'm running a two week, 50% off your initial consultation campaign. I'm running a one month first consultation free campaign. So that's where I want you to start thinking in terms of marketing being short term. Your branding is big picture. Your marketing is focused. It's single minded. It's targeted. Your branding is strategic. Your marketing is tactical, tactical. This is what we need to do action. Uh, and again, I said your branding begins inside your organization and your marketing begins with the consumer. So that's where the thinking is at in terms of marketing. Before I get into a quick intro into social, let me do the intro into social and then I'm going to um, get into a couple of questions. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I want to go into a clip, a video clip that I want you to watch. So that is a video <clears throat> that, um, that's been doing the rounds for a little while. And um, I know you're going to have a specialist come in and talk to you about social media, but I thought it just contextualizes so much of it so beautifully. Um, and especially now with where our world is at, I mean, I've made a conscious decision not to watch too much news. So when there's something big or important happening that I actually think I need to focus, I get it on social media or digital platforms or someone says, actually pay attention, um, the president's speaking tonight, then I'll know that the president's speaking. So it's become such um, an extension of our networks, of our communities, social media, that right now, um, I'm doing a webinar next week just on, on specifically marketing for the new world. And I was doing some research this week around this post COVID-19 world and marketing in it. And it's fascinating how it's become the go-to place for people to get their information, but also for people to find communities and people to connect with, to feel a sense of peace or calm or relief or guidance or advice to navigate this crazy world that we're living in at the moment. So, in terms of small business and in terms of marketing, um, there are a couple of big ones that are definitely going to take a knock, that are already taking a knock. 
uh, but we are in a unique position to use this tool called social media and use it effectively to engage audiences and engage audiences in a very different way. So obviously if I was doing this masterclass with you a month ago, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, the way I managed this section of it would have been quite different um, around business focus and brand focus being business centric and brand centric. But the way in which we engage with people now, we've really got to be quite sensitive about it. I belong to so many entrepreneurial networking groups and just watching the different things that are happening now where someone put a mailer out the other day saying, put a message out on one of the groups saying, even though the world is, is in disarray with us, it's business as usual, so give us a call. And she got such bash, backlash because uh, the community found it so insensitive of her to say that it's business as usual because people are going through real pain real stress, real anxiety, real uncertainty. And it created a disconnect with her, a complete disconnect with her as a business owner. Oh, you carry on in your corner with business as usual. For those of us who are having complete business unusual or not usual or business breakdown or business fear or business anxiety, I can't relate with you on any level. So actually, I don't even want to engage, even if you have something of value to add. So I'm not saying that her approach was right or wrong. I'm sharing an example with you around how we have to be really conscious and sensitive about how we're engaging on these platforms and um, see how we can still bring an authentic voice across. And if we do at this time, if we are fortunate enough at this time to still have something from a business perspective that is adding value, that is an extension, an add on a support to an essential service, if not an essential service already, then we must use our platforms to engage. So, I want to quickly share the screen. Um, yes, I'm going to go back to my screen and just share. I'm going to go through it very quickly and I'm really going to leave it to the professional who's going to sit with you next week um, to share um, that. But I just quickly wanted to share a process with you um, around social media because so many people get this wrong and decide I've got to be everywhere and I've got to be talking to everyone and that's the biggest mistake you make. So the first aspect is to really get to understand the different networks and select the appropriate media. I like don't try to be everywhere. You're going to do your brand a disservice. You're going to compromise whatever brand equity you've built in the marketplace already. If you put profiles out that are sitting dead, dormant, and not engaging. Uh, you want to decide on frequency. How regularly do I want to be creating content? How regularly do I want to be talking to people? And then the content creation aspect. This is quite a lot of pressure for entrepreneurs such as ourselves who have a huge to-do list and taking care of often every functional area in the business. Or maybe now is a perfect time for you to start sitting, to, to, to sit down and dedicate time to creating that content. I know um, one of you was saying, it was you, Dipur, that now you have their time to get the house in order, to focus on some things internally, admin stuff. Maybe this is the time to also start creating that content. From a content perspective, it isn't only the pressure to create your own content. Remember to tap into networks, to re remember to tap into industry globally, locally, and you can leverage off their content. Share their content, comment on it, and start to create those connections, uh, brand associations online. It's lovely to do. You then want to schedule your content so that you're not under the pressure of saying, oh, I have to be posting at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning on Facebook every Tuesday. You want to really schedule that and use a tool so that it's happening automatically. And then this is where so many businesses get it wrong. It's entirely pointless to engage in doing anything on social media, to take on anything in social media if you are not taking care of the social aspect of social media. So if you are not engaging, don't bother doing it. Um, if someone's commenting on something and you're not responding, you might as well kill the page. So ensure that you are engaging. And then a very important one on the end is to really do the monitoring and the evaluation. Get the reporting done so that you know if what you are doing is of value, if it's having an impact, and if it's engaging and targeting the right audience. So. Yeah, that's what I wanted to share um, with you on social media. So we're not going to take a break. What I want to do is stop sharing my screen. And I want us to talk a little bit around what I shared from a marketing perspective. I'd like you to share with me 
any specific thoughts you've had, any questions you have in your mind, any concerns, anything specific that maybe has happened from a marketing perspective in your business that you want to run by. Um, I don't know if there's questions already in the chat box. I haven't been looking, but let's open it up and let's talk. Belang, will you tell me if there's anything I missed on the chat? No, there isn't any question yet on the chat. And um, yeah, but the guys can still indicate if they want to be unmuted, then we'll just unmute them. Okay. Has anyone been doing anything in marketing? Um, has anyone had an idea in marketing? Have you thought about it? Have you only been in brand phase? Um, let me know. Hi, Raksha, it's Mr. Gozo. Hmm. Um, yes. what we, I think what we've, um, uh, thought about doing as Kondwani, we've, I'm not sure if it's, I think it is marketing. We've started like a little conversation well a little safe space almost you can call it um on instagram we uh, i think we started it this tuesday and it's something that we want to obviously do every other tuesday going forward it's almost like an instagram live where we literally just have open and frank conversations about obviously what is happening right now uh trying to spread positivity and also just kind of having other businesses think about ways we can collaborate around this time ways that we can think about our post lockdown strategies our 90 all of that stuff just kind of motivating each other on how to work moving past the space and what i've realized is it's created a whole new platform for us i mean i think our numbers have definitely gone up in terms of who's seeing our socials and i think when we did it we were not even thinking about that but i think within that one day we probably added about 20 new followers onto our socials so that was just like a whole thing and we were never even thinking about it in that manner but i think now what we what we were thinking of doing now is obviously then trying to get even more entrepreneurs come on and then also just creating even if it's like the first two minutes of it to promote your business as well during that time so that we at least get business still around this time um using that platform mm, lovely. Yeah. lovely 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 so it's such a nice thing because it's exactly <clears throat> It's exactly the way in which I started this masterclass with you. It is that, fine, we all exist as businesses. We all have content to share. We all have something we want to sell. We all have value. But there is a reality. There's a shared reality that we are going through at the moment for the first time ever in, in history in some of our lives. And um, we cannot discredit that. So it's beautiful to meet someone where they are at. That's what it feels like for me. So instead of trying to pull you to where I'm at and get yourself in the headspace to listen to my marketing pitch, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful tool in marketing to meet someone where they are at and engage there. So that's, that's just so powerful. Someone in my network, one of the entrepreneurs in my network yesterday had a chat with me and she said that she hasn't wanted to engage with her, with her audience because she can't sell, but she, in her nature, like in her core, She's a coach. She's a business coach. And she's really missing that engagement. And I said to her, well, if that's where your pain is coming from, that you can't engage with people and coach them around potential business pivot strategies, why not just put it out there? She put it out there yesterday and she got 20 one-on-one -on -one engagements already in one day. Um, so, so it's lovely to meet someone where they are at. And it's exactly because of that. It's exactly because it was done from such an authentic place that the following that the following shut up because people can gauge when it's too much of a sales pitch that it's too much of and and that your audience is really not in a space to listen to a sales pitch or to buy um it's that authentic and i love that you said you're creating a safe space for people to share so if the if the rest of us can apply our minds to that in our specific businesses it's and you can make it as detailed as a specific sector, as a specific offering. Do you want to be the voice who creates the space and the, be the catalyst for the conversations that need to be happening? And there's a lovely vulnerability that comes across in also saying, 
I don't have all the answers, but I'm creating the space in which for us to have the conversation and potentially come up with options that could be answers. So um, lovely. I really like that. And you, you do need to put a bit of a marketing hat on as well. You do need to put a bit of a marketing hat on you and your partner need to sit down and kind of just plot out a strategy around this so what next where are we taking this thing to now because this is the point of doing social media it's around building community that's exactly what you're doing you're starting to build a community so how am i engaging this community what does the post covid conversation look like and is it purely the sales pitch or is it some creative, innovative way to bring them into the fold of wanting to stay engaged around what the next steps are around your business? So just put a marketing hat on a little bit and think a little bit beyond COVID or how you could potentially grow this and this community. Nice. Dipuo, I see you have your hand up. Mrapilang, should we unmute Dipuo? Yeah, I think Dipuo uh, wants to say something. I thought she was unmuted. Uh, are you able to talk, Dipuo? Okay, let me do this. Okay, I think I'm fine now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, so Raksha, what I wanted to ask is that um, on the one hand, um, during this whole situation or during this whole time, you get advice that, um, you know, this is because people are at home, people have time, people are not really, you know, doing work as usual. People have more time on their hands. The best thing you could be doing for your business is punting a lot of marketing and um, maybe focus on that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's like you said right now, is, is this the best time to sell? Because maybe you're also being insensitive. People are just like obviously looking at their money and not wanting to buy anything because you don't know what tomorrow holds. Um, so I think it's just, what is, where is the balance there? Because yes, it is true that people do have more time um, on their hands at the moment. Um, you know, yeah, I love it, Dipo. It's such a good question. And I'm, I'm reflecting and I'm thinking about how to answer it for you because the answer I want to give to you is so deeply personal. Um, but I think I have to share it with you. So I, um, when the lockdown started, I was in full on business mode and I do the business development in summertime. So I, have all the client relationships. I'm the happiest when I'm on the road, in my car, going and seeing people, feeding off energy. Like that's, that's my role. And when the lockdown happened, I was working on some good proposals, some new good proposals for the year. And when it first happened, I had this paralysis set in, like absolute paralysis around, should I even be putting these proposals together? it was personal it was me it was what is happening to the world um yeah what is happening should i even be doing this it was a whole lot of that stuff that came in and then we went into that week because we went into lockdown on the thursday night and then we went into that first week and i suddenly felt like oof the kick in like my the beat energy kicked in and i was like come on do what you need to do this is what you do work on the proposals get them out craft the solutions and i put out these beautiful like Lots of work, collaborative proposals, lots of mind work going into crafting tailored offerings. Put all the proposals out. The next week was all the clients coming back and doing all the negotiations because everyone, everyone is in this uncertain space. But at the same time, everyone's thinking, I have to be doing something for my business. I can't just let it die. Um, so we went into the space of back and forth, back and forth, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. It was that whole week of like back and forth. And then I still felt okay. I was like, oh, I'm still doing something. Something's going to happen. Something's going to come. And throughout all of this was this whole personal journey of what is happening with the world? Uh, is everybody going to be okay? Um, survival mode versus this faith mode, this going between fear and faith and fear and faith and it's going to be okay or it's all falling apart. And I think the answer to your question is that, is that it is so deeply personal. It's personal for you, for what it is that you are going through as an entrepreneur and whether when you decide that you want to sell, from what space are you doing it? Because if you are doing it from a space of desperation, I have to get something in, oh my goodness, um, it's never going to work. And also understanding very realistically, what is your offer? 
offering and who is your target market and where are they at? Are people's mind spaces even open to a pitch right now? And I love it because Jayshree, what I mean is I love it. It's I love the reflection and the learning and questions that people like you ask that create space for me to reflect on the learnings is that Jayshree's holding her, her, her webinar, her chat series. And the first chat that she hosted um, with a lady who came on and was talking about the space. And I remember I asked the question in the chat. It was the first week of the lockdown. And I joined the chat and I joined the chat to ask that question. Should I be selling? Everyone's mindsets are, I don't know where everyone's mind is at and it feels like a sensitive time and I don't want to come across as insensitive and should I be selling? And what's happened in this three weeks is that it kind of did that and it did that where it was push, push, push and get a reality check, which really pushed me down that actually no one's ready. No one's ready to buy. Everyone's too uncertain. My client base is primarily SMEs and it's selling branding and marketing to SMEs. And they are all so uncertain about their future that there's a lot of resistance to spend. So I had to have that reality check that with all the negotiation, with all the hustling, with all the trying to find a way, still nobody was ready. And then I came and I bounced into to this nice equilibrium that said, actually, this is who we are, and this is what we do, and this is the value that we have to add, and I still want to engage my network and share insights with them and share content with them and see how we can still help. And what naturally started to happen for me was the people in my network who got it, the people in my network who got it, that actually uh, now is the time where I should be increasing my brand visibility that when people do settle and they're in a space to consume content again, um, they should be seeing me and they should be seeing me with the right energy and from the right space. So there's been new business, which has been phenomenal. And the energy and the space from which that new business is coming is entirely different to the energy with which I was trying to sell it at the start of the lockdown. So I'm sharing a very long and deeply personal story with you, Dipur. I don't know if it's helping you, but yes. um, that's the only answer I have to offer you, that the answer is deeply personal. It lies with where you are at, and it also lies with where your audience realistically is at, your target market, and your offering right now, whether it's okay. your, whether there's space for it. Okay, no, I, I completely understand. I think I've also had a similar experience is that uh, on the social media side of things, you know, I think I've kind of posed on hard selling, you know, showing the fancy stuff that we do and trying to put some tips, you know, how do you decorate your floating shelves at home or, you know, like small decorative tips like that. That's the kind of things that I want to be putting out there. But like you said, um, you know, those CEOs and those construction owner people that usually don't have time, I've tried to reach out to them and actually they like send your POE, send this. So I've realized that those people actually are responding and it seems like they are open to you selling. So yeah, that's been the difference. Yeah, on social media slowing down, but on those people that usually never have time for you, they've actually engaged, engaged me. It's a beautiful point that you're touching on because is your business a B2B business? Is it a business to business business? Or is it a B2C, a business to consumer business? So when we talk things like social media, what are the conversations that are happening on platforms? like LinkedIn versus what are the types of conversations that are happening on platforms like, for example, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter. So that's what I'm saying. Understand your industry, understand your target market. So is the CEO potentially the one who is your target market that is potentially looking into strat 12 months down the line and may say to you, let me keep the proposals in the background. Let's talk about it and let me see once we re-enter what we could potentially do together. If it's a B2C environment where people are at home a lot more, so they are focusing on home improvement. I've been hearing people say they're reconnecting with their power tools and getting things done in the house. People are getting creative. Is there opportunity to potentially share information in that space? So it's really understanding who you're talking to and where they're at. And at the same time, acknowledge that you are also a person you are a person going through this as well. You're a business owner and you have to deal with whatever it is that you are going through as well and how you are going to authentically put yourself out there and engaging for a style or in a marketing space. Thank you. Hope that helps. Good. Any other questions? Anyone?
Rapelang, was this the time where you wanted to take another break? Yeah, I think we can take a quick break now and then uh, it's eight minutes past um, 11. So let's come back just at, um, I think it should be at 18 minutes past if my math is correct. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we can, we can come back and then, um, yeah, we can maybe start with some of the questions the guys have and then we can take it from there. Yeah, just use the break to think about your marketing specifically and if there's any questions you have. Good. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, uh, let's go there first. Specifically, any reflections while you were having tea and biscuits about uh, marketing? I, th I think if I can just throw in something, Raksha, um, I know that now there's a big confusion around, does this time mean that I should be getting a customer? So it's, it almost seemed like uh, people or entrepreneurs think like, no, this is not the time to get a customer. So, um, and obviously the reality is that the business survived by you getting the customer. And I know that is different for, for um, every business and industries. So for instance, in our case, I mean, yesterday we did reach out to another client to pitch a new concept, but also that is um, really addressing the COVID-19 uh, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the client was quite very positive and very happy. And last week I was chatting to another entrepreneur. So she works with another big corporate. So, she was now more privy she's a contractor to that corporate she was now more privy to what's happening there what budget needs to be spent and all of that and it got me thinking because what she told me was that this corporate was very um, um desperate to spending money because they were just about to undergo audit and then they had to spend money because the b audit is coming so and she had to release about 52 million rents because she had within the same week, I think about three days for her to, 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 to spend that money because as much as we don't want to sell, but on the other hand, corporate have big monies to spend and they, they are stressed on who to spend that money with, where to spend that money. So sometimes we are afraid of pitching ideas and reaching out to them, whereas themselves, they are stressed because they are sitting with budgets that they have targets to spend it, but there's no one who's coming for uh, to them and really uh, uh, pitching any idea that they could have them spend that money. So I just thought I should uh, throw that out there just to say that this is not the time to think no one wants to spend money. There are corporates out there, there are businesses out there that want to spend for many re for one reason or another. And then we just should be mindful of that and not get discouraged. Absolutely. Such a lovely point, Rapilang. It's about knowing your target market. It's really knowing your target market and how well you have built your client relationships, how much of energy you have put into building your client relationships where you can still have these conversations. And, you know, sometimes it's as simple as a check-in not a sales pitch, it's a check in. And to understand, because these are the conversations we're all having as business owners, aren't we? Hello, a check in. And as an extension of that, so what's happening? Like what's happening in business? Are you alive? Are you functioning? Are you innovating? Are you pivoting? Are you dying? Are you closing? Are you retrenching? Um, all of these conversations are happening. So depending on um, who your target market is, uh, who your audience is, to really um, get real, uh, have a reality check about where they are at and reach out. It's a lovely point. It's a lovely point. We can't brush everyone with the same paintbrush. You know, it's that, it, it's unique. It's unique. And it's also aligned to the unique business offering sitting here in this, in this group. So nice point. Good. Uh, if there are any other questions, anyone? I don't think so, hey? I don't think anyone else is saying anything on marketing. So I'm going to go through, if there's anything that anyone still wants to add, we will talk it through. I want to do a very quick 
uh, talk on a quick bit on sales and then I want to just put it all together for you and then we're going to spend the last couple of minutes talking. I really want us to engage and I want you to talk to me about how it's going for you in your business around there and if there's any concerns you have. So let me share the screen again. And I want us to talk about sales. So it's such an interesting thing for me because I don't know how long we had been in business for, but I never wanted to claim ownership of that title, that I am I'm the salesperson, you know? Um, every business owner by default is a salesperson. You had the mind to create an offering to solve a specific problem or fill a specific need. So it is from that space that as a result, you will always be the best person to sell it. So depending on your personality, you may sometimes need to bring a person in to actually do that sales aspect for you. But if you were the creator of this thing, if you were the creator of the solution, intrinsically you understand deeply the pain point that you are solving for. So what is sales? Sales is really that activity, the activity-based aspect of this whole body of work. So this activity of selling your products or services, the exchange of a commodity for money or the action of selling something. So it's transactional. There's a seller and there's a buyer. And it's this whole process that happens to get a sale happening between these two parties. It's the personal interactions, the one-on-one -on -one meetings, the telephone calls, the networking, the relationship building. That is all an aspect of sales. And it's, it, I'd like to really point out that that comes naturally to some people. It's a natural extension of somebody's personality to want to be out and seeing people and connecting, attending networking events, uh, speaking at events. Um, there, there's a whole personality type that goes with that. And those types of people are really um, challenged during this time, myself being one of them. Um, the need to kind of feed off the energy of being with people and interaction. And it's, re it's a really lovely time right now to fully assess and understand if that is intrinsically who you are. Now it's really easy for you to get a sense of intrinsically if that is who you are. Are you the person who is saying, should I be calling that client? Should I be reaching out to that person? Should I be checking in on that? It's exactly what Rappelang is talking about. It's, it's, it's the, these are the people who see the opportunity when nobody else sees the opportunity. So start to think about it, about am I a salesperson naturally? And if I'm not naturally a salesperson, how am I building out my team to bring a salesperson in? So my partner would never be a salesperson. She could absolutely not stand sitting at a coffee shop or sitting in an office with someone day after day, meeting different people and just talking. Um, absolute introvert. So, so this is the stuff that you really need to get to the bottom of and, and have a sense of comfort that it's being taken care of well in your business and by the right personality. Because that salesperson also is an extension of your brand. So they need to be aligned. Um, so sales differs from marketing because marketing is about those campaigns that we're running and the programs that we're running to influence and create engagement with customers while, while sales is the physical act of going and engaging with them. And now that physical act is happening virtually. So let's start applying our minds to this world of sales. Good. There, I'm, I'm by no means a sales expert, but it's nice to have this high level knowledge. And I don't know if in your program, this will come in a bit more detail, but I'm just gonna give you a very high level intro into how the sales funnel works and how as people start to engage and, and, and as we differ from industry to industry and business type to business type, again, it leads into what Rappelang was saying. It's understanding your specific sales cycle your specific sales cycle. So if I have a sales meeting with someone on a Monday, am I expecting to have closed the deal and invoiced by the Friday? Or is the nature of your business that your sales cycle is gonna take a longer time? Is it a two month, three month? How long is it gonna to take to go from awareness 
to purchase. So there's the awareness aspect that I'm aware that you exist. There's the discovery aspect, the evaluation, intent, evaluation is I'm evaluating you. I'm understanding um, how do you provide this product or service versus somebody else. Maybe I've got a comparative quote, all of that stuff. There's the intent to purchase. Then there's the purchase. And the last part of the funnel is around loyalty, building loyalty. So align to the sales funnel is where you want to build a pipeline. A pipeline of, and, and we hear this being used all the time in business, is I am choosing to run an Instagram live weekly. Am I building a pipeline of that? Do those people who are engaging with us on that Instagram live, are they now part of the awareness aspect in my sales funnel? How can I move them from awareness into intent where they may be asking me for a proposal? How am I moving them from intent into loyalty? So this is really seeing how a sales funnel and a sales pipeline is put into action. So the pipeline moves from stage one where they are prospecting, stage two, qualifying leads, stage three where there's an initial interaction with a potential client, stage four where they're redefining what it is that they want, Stage five, where we make an offer, we put together a detailed proposal, we put together an offer of what it is we think that they need, we know that they need, or our unique take on solving that problem that they have. Stage six becomes the negotiation and the finalization of the proposal. And this is really where such skill comes out in true salespeople. True salespeople, I find the skill comes out really in this section with intent and negotiation is, if someone's really doing it as I have to do this because no one else is doing this, when it gets to negotiation, it's just a no. Oh, they said no, it's over. Whereas a truly skilled salesperson is going to go back saying, how can we navigate this? How can we make this work? Tell me what the problem is. Tell me how, where the challenge is for you at the moment in saying yes. So that negotiation muscle needs to be um, exercised a bit. Stage seven is around closing the deal. And stage eight, loyalty when delivering the product. How am I bringing them back in to create loyalty? How am I bringing them back in through things like referrals, through things like feedbacks, custom, customer survey, feedbacks, all of that stuff. So a very high level intro into the sales funnel. Where this becomes a part of what we are talking about today in terms of branding and marketing is I want you to see along the left of the screen is where the sales funnel had a huge percentage of it that was sales activity. Where you see the, the, the bracket at the bottom on the left that shows you how much of that was sales activity and how much of that was marketing activity. And if you look on the right of the sales funnel, a much bigger section of the sales funnel has now become about marketing. So if we are doing marketing well, then it is driving traffic into and informing and filling out our sales funnel now much more than it did in the history of how sales and marketing happened. And then the sales activity just comes in at the bottom where it's evaluation and purchase. So the marketing, there's opportunity for marketing in a much bigger section of the sales funnel. So I want to show you this picture I drew um, a good couple of years ago to show how these three aspects connect and why I created this marketing masterclass, this masterclass called branding, marketing, and sales is because I, I really want you to have a, a clear sense of how this should be done in your business. And when I say how, I mean, in what order, how regularly you should be revisiting it and how these sections play into each other in helping flesh out what the next step is in the process. So we start with, we start with branding. So we have to always start with getting the foundations and the building blocks in place. It's the setup of everything that we need to do. So if the setup is in place, then we have the foundations from which to start marketing. Once we do the marketing, we then can go on into sales because all the marketing material, the campaigns, the promotional aspects that we've created funnel or drive traffic into them sales into our sales activities. So this is really the, the, the consolidation of the whole process and where I really want you to start applying your minds to how you have been doing this to date, whether it has been effective, where there are potentially gaps and where you need to be putting a bit more attention into it. At the bottom of it though is brand. 
So branding will always sit at the bottom because like I said, the world is ever changing. So our offering could be pivoting, our offering could be evolving, there may be innovations in our space, there may be shifts in our market, our whole world is changing. So I'm not saying that you need to rebrand every year, please do not do that because whatever brand equity that you've built to date will be compromised. What I do want you to have a degree of flexibility around is that if something does change, we can do tweaks, we can do iterations, we can do shifts. And if at some point there's such a big significant shift or change in your business, you may need to rebrand. So that's the real snapshot of how it all fits together. And I want you to apply your minds to that. Um, I have another video that I usually play here, but I don't think it's gonna translate well here. So I'm not going to play it. I, I want to end the webinar here, but actually I want to share some content that's come out from some of the questions that have come through. So if you just bear with me, I'm gonna stop the screen share and I'm gonna bring up some additional slides from another presentation. Punola, we're not ending. I'm leaving time for us to talk. I really want us to talk and I really want us to engage on your businesses specifically. <laughs> so get ready to talk, my dear. Um, let me share the screen. So I want to talk about the concept of brand architecture. I know um, like Paseka was talking about additional brands and sub brands. And I don't know if some of you are also thinking around those things. I want to introduce these concepts of brand architecture and brand evolution to you. So if you are launching additional brands, if there is a primary brand and there's a secondary brand and you're not quite understanding how you need to do this, I want you to think here, before you go and say to a graphic designer, create another logo. Um, think here and then when you do go and brief that creative, um, it's coming from a much more strategic place and it's coming from a place that's aligned with your vision, your long-term visions and goals for your business. So the first approach on the left is called a branded house. And that's kind of like your Google Virgin approach. But the primary brand is a specific look and feel, it has a specific brand identity and all the associations around it. And then the sub brands will link into that. So like um, Virgin Money and a Virgin Gym and a Virgin whatever, you, we, we look at like a Google Books, Google Maps, Google Translate. Um, how the, everything that's associated with that primary brand then becomes associated with that secondary brand. Secondly, we'll look at a house of brands, like a Procter & Gamble. Uh, so like a Procter & Gamble, the, the secondary brands are client facing like your Gillette, your Head and Shoulders, your Pampers, et cetera. Those brands, the secondary brands are client facing. They have independent brand identities. They're talking to independent target markets and they are not necessarily associated with the primary brand in the retail or in the client facing space. Our average consumer does not necessarily know that Procter & Gamble is the primary brand behind a for example, a Pampers brand. So that's a house of brands approach where they are seemingly independent and each sub brand has its own look and feel, its own target market and independence from everything else, separate market share, profits, etc. Then we get a hybrid like our lovely Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola is in the beverage industry. But in the market on the front end, there is Minute Maid Juice, there's Bon Aqua Water, there is Sprite, there's Coca-Cola, there is all sorts of things. Um, every sub brand is still a beverage. So there is some, there is a combination of the house of brands and a branded house approach. So there's a combination of, they seemingly independent brands in the market. So a target market for a Bon Aqua Water could be, or a Powerade juice, Powerade energy drink, could be quite different to a target market for a Coca-Cola. So they have independent brand identities, they have independent target markets, um, but they have a hybrid approach because the primary brand and the secondary brand have a common 
a commonality in that they are in the beverage industry. So I want you to think about that. So a couple of years ago, when we were doing um, a brand, we've worked with this client of ours for years and years and years. And he's, he's he runs an amazing architecture firm. And as his architecture firm started to grow, his business network started to grow. And he came back to us a couple of years later and he said to us, I'm now launching a transport business, I'm launching a property business, I'm launching a trust, I'm launching a this, I'm launching, there were four sub brands. And we had to go back and look at his brand architecture and we really had to align it to his business strategy and his business vision. And we went back and we took a branded house approach because the name was the commonality across all the businesses and the, the value system that he had associated with his primary business uh, was the value system with which he had gone and launched all the other businesses. So we actually launched um, a, a new primary brand. We set the sub brand in, which was now the primary brand to date. And then we launched a whole lot of sub brands aligned to that. So that's been a beautiful work, body of work where fortunately enough, because he had used a name, like a personal name aligned to it, we were able to do that. But sometimes we don't always have that luxury. So I really want you to apply your mind to it if there is a vision down the line for additional things. If you're thinking about a divisional structure, this is where Raphael Lang and I talk a lot because he's my go-to person. So when companies come to me and say, I need to register this, I need to register that, I think I'm going to start this, I go back to Raphael Lang, I'm like, oh goodness, tell me what the business structure needs to look like because I need to align the brand architecture with the business structure in the marketplace so that there isn't confusion. So I want you to think brand architecture. This is, here's another lovely example. Our friends at Virgin who have this primary brand that is all about being bold and daring and innovative and different and courageous and sometimes a bit cheeky. So every single thing that they launch as a sub-brand, whether it fails or succeeds, uh, carries all the qualities of that primary brand. So I love you to think about that in terms of brand architecture. And then I want to talk about brand evolution because when I put the big arrow at the bottom that says branding, that sits consistently across branding, marketing, and sales, this is kind of where I don't want you to feel so stuck in that this is what I am and this is what I always have to be. So brands like, like Coca-Cola, I mean, look at what Coca-Cola looked like in 1886. And look at how in 1905, they caught onto something. They caught on to something that was the unique Coca-Cola look and feel. And it's so beautiful for me how from 1905, right up until now, 2020, um, they have managed to maintain a degree of consistency. I'm not sure what happened in 1985 there, but it was definitely the, the, um, the technology.com going online, minimizing, but they quickly pulled it back and understood how a good amount of brand equity had been built on that Coca-Cola look and feel. Look how quickly they reverted. In 1985, they went to a different font and a different look and feel. In 1987, they quickly took it back. So there is, there is space in your business to allow for brand evolution. Just understand, always know why. Please always know why it is that you want to do a brand evolution. Um, is it that your market has changed? Is it that the way in which people consume information has changed? Is it that the way brands are interacting with people has changed? So, so start to just think about that. Another lovely example that I, I like to share is KFC. KFC. That our younger generations today in 2020 do not even know that KFC is an acronym. Some of you on this call as well, that KFC is an acronym for the full name Kentucky fried chicken. They know it as KFC. So look at how this brand evolution has gone from 1952 up until now and how there's been an aspect that has been consistent, which is the kernel. So the kernel has consistently been present in the brand identity. His bow tie jobby has definitely changed between, didn't change, it got shortened between 1952 and today, but they have managed to maintain a degree of consistency with their brand, but shift aspects around it to talk to the world as it shifted and evolved, and also used color nicely as a tool to maintain some degree of consistency. So that's what I wanted to share with you in terms of brand evolution and brand architecture. Um, let me stop the screen share.
And I'm going to go back to us now chatting. We have a full half hour if you need it, or I can give you some time in your day back. But I'd really love for us to use the next 20 minutes to half an hour to just have a conversation around everything that I shared from a branding, marketing, and sales perspective. I hope that you've been doing a mental audit of your business as I've been talking and really understanding where there may have been some gaps and what you may need to do some work. In. So wrap along, I'm going to hand back to you and maybe you can um, help me out if there are questions or any engagement. Yeah, I think the, the guys can um, engage because this is really an opportune time to discuss also their um, internal issues in, the, uh, in how they approach marketing, in how they approach branding, just so that maybe you can give a few advice around maybe what um, they need to be doing and uh, even even now that they have all the time to work on their marketing strategy and branding so maybe how they can unlock you know um, some of the uh, strategies that can really take their business forward while you know they have all the time to focus around that so maybe they can just um, engage you around that just so that you can give them a few insights on what they need to be <laughs> to be doing at, at this. That's why I was saying initially that uh, people are thinking that uh, we shouldn't be selling now. We should just be waiting because we don't know how long we are waiting. But, uh, you know, our, our revenues are being affected. So the only way that they can be um, um, uh, that situation can be resolved that's when we start selling so when is the right time to start selling should we be selling now is it a turn off for our client so but i think in our business we have taken a conscious decision to continue selling yesterday we were selling to a big major client a new concept altogether and then and then um, um, um today again we are doing something else so 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 yeah those are just some of the realities and uh, we are all stuck but i think if we can advise one another it will be great to see what other people are doing mm. good so let me hear from you please you can unmute and if you want you can even put your video on so that we can chat and see each other that will always also be really yeah, let's see bonolo want to say something hi yeah so um the audit of my business has been happening for some time, but I suppose now during the lockdown, there's been no excuse in terms of actually implementing the various components. So I started with just an audit of the brand in terms of our positioning and what we stand for. Um, and that we've done on the website and um, adding ourselves to Google, just so we Googleable <laughs> yeah. and all of that sort of thing. Um, social media has, obviously, has always been a weak point for me. We've had a presence on Facebook, great, but I've always complained about the audience and the quality of the audience on Facebook. So we started the Instagram page literally probably two weeks ago and trying to find relevant content in the space that we're in now. The interesting thing in terms of our work is that irrespective of whether people are working from home or some people essential services, there'll always be a, a link back to their commitments contractually in the um, workspace world. So we found a service that we can offer from an advisory point of view to say, listen, if there are rental commitments, we can maybe mediate between yourselves and your landlords around what the rental commitments are. And that's been quite inundating in terms of people contacting us and looking for assistance there, um, which again, reiterates some of our, not necessarily core service offering, but secondary service offerings. And um, to say we are experts in this field, we are connected, we are aware of what you're going through and we can assist. So um, just, putting our hands up and being available in that way has really helped us in terms of marketing some of our other services because at the end of the lockdown also, people may not need office space for 100 people. They may want to have certain people work remotely um, and so on and so forth. So again, there we become relevant. So it's creating a pipeline for using the situation now by creating a future pipeline to say, listen, 
your situation and circumstance might change and we are here to assist. So that's, that's helped. So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, Bonolo. I love it. Um, yeah, good going with websites and becoming Googleable. That's almost like a non-negotiable. That is a non-negotiable in business right now. Uh, mm. That's the foundation from which we all have to start building. Um, I've been seeing on so many of my entrepreneur WhatsApp chats, people sharing all the free tools that are available for um, Google, Google for Business specifically. You know that that people need to know that you exist, people need to know where you are and how to tap into those marketing tools. But what you're talking about, and I love this whole rental mediation, mediator, mediation service offering. It's just, it's so having your finger on the pulse and responding to a need. And that's the sweet spot. Um, the, the Americans have done it very successfully up until now and didn't kind of need a pandemic to push them into the space. They've been doing it for years, which is called the freemium model, hey? Where you give some, something away for free to an extent, and beyond that, a paid, a paid version kicks in. Or beyond that, I'm able to create marketing space to tell you about what else I can offer. So that's really nice. So maybe for the rest of you, um, to just, you know, sometimes just putting a term to it will help you con contextualize it and apply your mind into say, what is our business's unique freemium model? What is our freemium model? What are we able to give away for free? Because it also helps you to gauge. It helps you to gauge where people are at in terms of spend. What are they willing to spend on and what are they able to get from you for free? So think about that for now. Um, yeah, and see how you can put that into effect in your business. I know with some of you in manufacturing, um, that may be a bit of a challenge, but even for those of you who are in production and manufacturing, there is IP sitting in here. <coughs> there is knowledge and IP sitting in there that a network can benefit from. So think about that. You know, I've just been watching all the, um, the services-based businesses um, like myself, just look at how we can offer things. And it's been so interesting that um, yesterday, was yesterday, Sorbe, you know, the nail care group Sorbe, sent out a mailer for um, two things, how to do your own home facial. They're having a webinar, how to do your own home facial and how to do your nails at home. So it was so cool. It was so interesting um, that they had tapped into this whole idea of this freemium model. And, and for them, it was di directly in line with what their paid services are. So it's about having the confidence that my service offering is so, for lack of a better word, premium, it's being done so well that it can still kick back into the paid version when people are out moving in the world again. But for now, I'm going to give a version of this, a free version of this to my audience. So. Yeah, think about that for you. What is your freemium model? Hmm. A hand up or a message? Paseka, you want to come on and ask so that I don't have to read? Okay. <laughs> All right. So you showed a very fascinating slide there regarding the um, sales cycle funnel. Um, I, really, I really wanted to indulge a bit more on that, eh? Um, the, the ratio of tasks, they tended to tilt, okay? So then you had more of the, 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 the sales being, uh, sorry, uh, I'm actually, but I'm trying to, <laughs> to picture it again. Do you want so, me to bring it up? Yeah, yeah, I think you should bring it up. Let's discuss it as we're looking at it. It will make more sense. The one that had the brackets on the side with the marketing and sales or the one that had the funnel and the pipeline? Uh, the one that had the then on the left and then the now on the right, that one. Yes, this one. Okay, as you can see, then we have marketing tasks being very minimal as far as the ratio is concerned. And now we have the marketing tasks as more. Sales being more 
back then and less now. So does this imply that the budget that we allocate and the, 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 the energy, the resources uh, that we channel towards these particular tasks, does that also um, relate to this particular chart or is this just generic and not necessarily implying on the resources and, and, and energy? Absolutely, absolutely implying on the resource. So um, okay. the activities need to still happen. Let's just be clear on that, yeah? The activities that need to happen around building awareness, building interest, doing the work to create consideration, uh, putting the proposals out to create intent, um, creating platforms for people to evaluate and then purchase. The, the, yeah, the, the body of work that needs to happen in the funnel is still there. Where the thinking needs to shift is that sales happens with a sales person and a sales team. Now, because of technology and because of the way the world has evolved, we are able to use marketing really well to allow for a whole lot of those things to happen quicker, more streamlined. Like, for example, you see how these, it's just the top of my head, how these insurance company websites um, give you a comparison tool or a cell phone provider gives you a tool to compare the different packages if you want to take out a new contract. Or, you know, the consideration aspect has yes. been digital. So where the salesperson would have to do a whole lot of work to go and analyze what the competitor is doing and analyze this and go and show it, like a whole lot of it has now come into smart marketing efforts. Okay. Am I answering your question? So yes, you it goes very business to business. You will have to think about it from a resources and a budget perspective. But definitely, that is definitely what we are implying, that there is a whole lot of now marketing tools and tactics that can be used to take care of much more of the sales function. And if you look at the slide on the right that says the now, yeah. it's definitely suited to the entrepreneurial world, to our SME base, where we don't have the luxury of huge workforces with big skill levels, where we can now leverage these cool technologies and reduce the load as a salesperson. Sure. Yep. No, you're making sense. Thank you. I am answered. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Does anyone have anything unique or interesting that they have seen happening um, in the space from a brand and marketing perspective that you thought that's nice to share? Okay. Wrap it along. So if not, so if we don't have any more questions or any engagement or anyone wanting to kind of talk around their businesses, then I think I may be done. Let me just check with Jayshree if uh, she's back on the line as yet. And then if not, so then we can continue with something. Hi, Jayshree, are you? Hi, Hi yeah. wrap along. <laughs> Oh, I am okay. here, so that's fine if Raksha's done. Um, I see there's a couple new messages coming through. Okay, so Raksha, I think you've handled all of the chats and questions. Hey. Yes, I think so. Yes. Okay, great. Let okay. me switch. Spumi, Spumi's been uh, commenting so beautifully on this chat about it being thought provoking and interesting. Did you want to share anything? <laughs> around where your thinking is at i'm actually following you know i'm, I'm i think i did speak to chase about the my concern about branding and, and marketing and she said you must not miss this so i've been concentrating and taking notes now good yeah. making Do you want sure to that you know i <laughs> so i i also think these slides um one can if we can have them also to recap i think they are so information I, I really enjoy the this this this, this session. Um, brand evolution. Wow. Okay. I think that's that was new to me. I didn't know KFC started as Kentucky Fried Chicken. Honestly. Really? Wow. I did not know. <laughs> and I've seen Coke as well. I'm asking myself why are you, they keep on changing their brand so much. And, but you you showed something there that there's that element of consistency. 
that you don't miss um, the brand. Okay? But I've I've changed the branding on my business, and I just spoke to my to my to my to the guy that's doing our logo to say, don't you think we've we've changed before we we spoke to why we actually need those colors to change um, as far as the company way is going. So he's been he's he's also in WhatsApp. So I've spoken to him. Um, so we need to sit and talk about why we want to change our colors. Um, yeah, but look, I'm, I'm I'm enjoying this session. Honestly, I'm interested to hear why do you say hey, brand and marketing doesn't work or didn't work for you, and what's your thinking now after we shared this content? Pardon that. Pardon that. Sorry about that. You were saying that you had shared with Jay Shri that branding and marketing doesn't work. That's what you said just now. I'm interested to hear, like, what was happening, or do you believe it doesn't work in general, or was it just not working for your business? Um, and has it shifted for you? I'm just interested. I think it, it was a gap on, on, on our business. It was something like a, a, an opportunity. It was something like we, we, we lack in our business. I think our, our I saw it as. As, as something that one needs to really work on as, as a challenge within the business. And I still say to that, you know, I, I feel that the look and feel of the business is, is not really positioning itself properly, you know. And she said that, look, maybe this cause, um, because we discuss skills, selling skills, um, we've discussed project costing. We've just, but branding was part of that feedback we gave. We gave back. We gave to her, and she said. So I was following this, and I, I realized that look, it's it's actually something that is can work within the construction space, which is what our our company is doing, because we don't want to concentrate much on on the work that we get from government. We also want to take the business position the business within the corporate space so that somebody can identify what we do and be able to, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah. call us for a business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's very interesting. It's, it's a really great opportunity. If you are briefing sure. in China at the moment, it's a really nice opportunity now for you to stop and be very intentional with what you're doing every single aspect of it aligned to who you want to be talking to so yeah i hear you i hear you okay yeah. interesting i've worked with a good yeah. couple of construction companies and it's interesting because um it's it's easier to find a bit of uniqueness i found when i've been working with construction companies so yeah. do you think they're a bit more tap in there a little deeper around why you and then uh, ensure that you are infusing that into your brand identity. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, thank you. I really, I really, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Good. Yeah, so I think. As, yeah, I think as a comment, uh, Raksha, um, it was really quite an informative session for especially what the entrepreneurs are going through at the moment because a lot of businesses will find themselves, especially when you discuss the brand architecture and different focus areas of the business and how uh, brand focuses should be created. So I think a lot of businesses will, will find themselves in a situation where they, they, they branch out also into a non-core service that has been created by COVID. <laughs> and then how do you still retain the messaging so strong and, and so aligned such that you are now no, not necessarily that you are leaving your core business, but you are being pushed and disrupted into, you know, pivoting into uh, something COVID related. And I'm not talking about um, uh, sanitizers or, or <laughs> hot gloves or, 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 or hygiene products that, that people are doing now, but there are a lot of strategies that now business are, are for instance, for the guys that are into uh, um, maintenance and 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 um, not really maintenance, but facilities management. So part of that is cleaning. They are doing a lot of stuff around hygiene, but now COVID is changing the whole way hygiene is done, and 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 that is going to talk to how now they have to consider that as fac facilities managers because now they have to also look at the the, the risk associated with 
health and safety within the building. And then COVID has brought a whole range of, you know, um, a disruption in, in, in how now they, they will be doing their business. And I think it can like give them an idea to say that don't leave your business, but you can still branch into something that complement your service offering while you are able to channel the message properly <laughs> because it's all about ensuring that the messaging is intact while you are also venturing into other um, opportunities that, that, that you have been led into by um, the, the COVID. But I think, you know, you really covered a lot of aspects to just get us thinking a lot about our businesses. Hmm. Good, lovely. Love that input, Rappelang. So, <laughs> Propreneur X, friends, I'm going to say thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm not a stranger to you, so you know me, you know my details, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, and I just wish you all the best in going out there and just really building brands with intention that are speaking to a very specific need and aligned to your goals and visions for your business and your life. So thank you. Thanks, Jayshree. Thanks, Rappelang. Thanks so much. Jesh, you're muted. Hello, Jesh, you're muted. I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank you so much, Raksha. It was lovely seeing you again. Well, the, I've got the puppy barking in the background, so I didn't want to interrupt you guys. <laughs> so thanks for that session, Raksha. It was really informative. Um, you know, when we did our gap analysis, as I mentioned, so many entrepreneurs had listed marketing as one of the gaps so i i did encourage some of them thanks for taking up that offer and after the session if there are still gap structure we'll arrange uh, mentoring sessions for the entrepreneurs that need it after the leadership team has had a chance to look at the gap analysis mm -hmm. and if they can't fulfill any of those we'll definitely pass them over to you to do your one-on-one -on -one mentoring with them Thanks, Jesh. Good. Thanks, Rappalang. If the entrepreneurs can stay on, I'd like to just speak to you and give you some feedback on the meeting we had with uh, Mot Singh and the letter that we wrote to the minister. So, Raksha, thank you so much. Eh? You're welcome to stay on, um, but for now, we can release you. <laughs> Good. Bye, everybody, and all the best. And I hope to engage with each of you again in the future. Bye now. Bye.